All right. Well, good morning to everyone that is here. As uh, Hannah has already mentioned, it doesn't matter how many are gathered. I believe the, the Bible says where two or three are gathered, uh, there the Lord is also. So um, even though there's not many of us today, uh, the Lord is with us. The Lord is here. And we just ask that his, I just ask that his spirit is with us as we together um, come to his word and, uh, and see what, what, uh, what he has to, to say to us through his word today. Uh, I would just remind you, uh, and I'm sure you know this, but it's good for us to be reminded that uh, I only stand here as the mouthpiece, hopefully, through which the word of God is being portrayed, um, and the call is for us as a body of believers to uh, come before the word of God, the um, inerrant, all-sufficient word of God. So um, would you pray with me before I um, begin um, reading the scripture? Lord, we come to you this morning and thank you for your presence with us. God, I'm amazed this morning that you, even though we are finite, weak creatures, you choose to give your presence to us, to be here with us. You've done that through your son, and so I ask this morning that as we come to your word, that your spirit would open our eyes to see what it's telling us, what you are saying to us. May you give us hearts to accept it, and hearts to hear it, and Apply it. May your spirit give us the strength to go from here and live in the places that we live <clears throat> in your strength and in your light. Thank you for your light. Thank you that your son is the light of the world. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. This morning, the passage is Ephesians 5, 6 through 21, and I'm just going to read it, and then um, we'll dive in. So Ephesians 5, 6 through 21. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled 
with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to do something a little unconventional. I'm going to read it again and just just soak in the words of, of Scripture. And I'm actually going to go back and I'm going to, I'm going to start from verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness nor foolish talk nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper! And arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, I read this twice today, partly because I've struggled with this message, and I can't place my finger necessarily why, but I just felt the need that we need, we need to see what Scripture says. We need to soak in the Scriptures. A little bit of background to um, the church at Ephesus. That, that's who Paul's writing to in this letter. Ephesus was a trade city on the Aegean Sea, if you have any idea where that is. Um, it, was on, it was on the Aegean Sea, so there would have been boats trade boats in and out of there. There would have been a lot of trade happening. Um, things from, people would have been bringing uh, goods from the country to have it put on boats or whatever. 
So there was a lot of volume of people in and out of Ephesus. You would have had uh, men coming with, with their goods, whatever uh, they had to put on boats and send it away. You would have had boats coming in from other places docked in the port for a time. And obviously, this wouldn't have been with their families. They would have left their established communities and, and been by themselves. This is a recipe for a sinful city. Uh, I, I don't know if you can compare it uh, to Vegas, but think of Vegas. That's maybe what you would have had here at Ephesus. Darkness, sin at every corner. Um, that's who Paul is writing to here. There would have been, obviously, a lot of sexual immorality. Um, they had the temple of their, uh, of their god, Artemis. Artemis. Um, and, and the business, if you remember back in Acts 19, they, they say when Paul's there, uh, the, the craftsmen for the, for the shrines that they made of their god, they said, if this man, Paul, is allowed to preach his, his uh, gospel, it's going to tear down our business of, of making these shrines of our God. So we want him out of here. This would have been a place of, of much sin. And, and this is the people that Paul is telling to not even have any of these things, sexual immorality, Kevin covered this last week, but sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthiness, foolish talk, crude joking. He's saying, don't even have these things named among you. And these, these would have been new believers they wouldn't have grown up in church. Uh, Paul planted this church. These would have been people that have, have come out of these types of things, have experienced them in their own lives, and are still living among this sinfulness in their own city. And so Paul gets into verse 6 then, after he tells them not to have this named among you. He says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Paul warns these people to not let anyone deceive them with empty words. What would these empty words be? I, I don't pretend to know, but if there was deception, there could have been this idea that if you say God is who he is, then grace covers whatever, whatever sin, and that's true, but it's not a license to sin. As Paul says in Romans. So these empty words, Paul says, let, let, don't be deceived by them. The wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience because of these things. God will pour out his wrath on sin. That is certain, Paul is saying. Do not let anyone tell you otherwise. So he says then in verse 7, Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now 
you are light in the Lord. You were darkness. And, and notice, Paul, Paul gets into identity. He's talking about identity here. We, we live in a, in a moralistic culture that, that says, where I am today, I'm in church, I dress like I'm in church, and I act like I'm in church. Therefore, I've achieved some level of status. But that never actually gets to identity. That's human achievement. Making a name for ourselves. I want you to notice that, that Paul said, mentions sons of disobedience. He uses a familial term, sons. And he says, you were at one time that, sons of disobedience. And you lived out of that identity. You were involved in works of darkness, which he'll talk about later. You were involved in sexual immorality, impurity, covetousness, filthy talk. The list could go on and on and on. I believe Kevin said this last week. This, this is just a few. It's not a comprehensive list of, of sins. We know there's gossip. <laughs> there's lying, which he mentions in the last chapter in Ephesians. He says, put away lying. But he uses this familial term, sons of disobedience. That is your identity before Christ. We were all sons of disobedience before Christ. And as you'll notice, he walks on. And what does he say? Does he say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps? Be better. Do better. No. The good news about the gospel is not an improvement plan that you get to achieve more and do better and be better. The good news of the gospel is you are now changed at the core, your identity. You are now, as he says, light in the Lord. And notice he says, in the Lord. You are not light in yourself. We are living in a culture that, that tells us that if we just look deep enough, we might be able to find some kind of light with, within us that we can then shine to the world. And folks, you will not be able to dig deep enough and find that. Why? Because before Christ... At the core of your being, you lived out of an identity of being sons of disobedience. You were darkness. But the good news of the gospel is in Jesus, who is the true light, you are now light in the Lord. Apart from the Lord, Outside of the Lord, your darkness. He says, walk as children of light. We had no problems living in accordance with our old identity. That was natural, as I'll get out, right? But now, Paul is saying, you have a new identity. 
and he's saying, walk in it. Walk as children of light. We have an identity crisis in our country today. We don't know who we are. We have problems identifying male and female. You were given an identity by your creator, your loving creator. He created them, male and female. And it's good because he's good. And yet we struggle with our identity today in our culture. And you look at the church as a whole in America. And I fear that we also have an identity issue. We're giving in to this notion that sin isn't that big of a deal. Sin doesn't matter. But, Paul says, that's what the wrath of God is coming on. And I believe that, that this letter and, and the word of God today would speak to us, even though we're maybe few in number this morning. Walk as children of light. Who is this light? I touched briefly on it, but it's Jesus. The light that we are children of. Is, is a light that, that exposes our darkness because it's a light from outside of us. It's not inside of us. You all, I don't know if you, you looked at the uh, eclipse this past week. Um, I didn't look at it because I didn't have the glasses, but... I wonder how many times you've looked at the sun in the past couple years in the dead of the day, in, in, in um, the heat of the day. You, you don't, you, the sun's just something that kind of comes up and goes down, and it gives us light. But we're thankful for it, right? It's a source of light from outside of us. Jesus is the light that shines into our darkness. John, I'm going to go read that. John 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. John the Baptist was not the light. You and I sitting here today are not the light. If we have been made children of light, we bear witness about 
him, the true light. Paul goes on then in Ephesians 10 and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. This is this is I I think where the rubber meets the road in a sense. Paul tells us to find out what is pleasing to God. And to an unbeliever, that might sound restrictive. Why? Because all we can see when we're in darkness is that God is just a restrictive God. He doesn't let me do what I want to do. But Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, sweating drops of blood, prayed, may this cup pass from me. He was going to take the wrath of God in your place and my place. And he said, let this cup pass from me, but yet not as I will, but as you will. Now, was Jesus just a disciplined individual who walked the line, as it were? Or did he see his father as being completely worthy of obeying? Hebrews says he obeyed even unto death. What drove him to such obedience? Was it because he was the best disciplinarian possible? Or was it because he saw his father and his father's will and what pleased his father as being the greatest thing ever? Because his father is just that good. And yet we as people, me, so easy for me at the, at the smallest little thing that doesn't go my way. Or that I see scripture is telling me to do something against what I want to do. My first inclination is, God is not good. May that be gone. May that be out of our lives. Because the truth of the matter is, Jesus' life declares, my Father is good. And he went to the cross... Yes, he loved us. But I think we miss another love that's at work here. And Jesus loved his father. Loved him dearly. The scripture reading we read, Jesus is praying to his father. I saw in my life as I was preparing for this message and I realized it just this morning that I feel like I struggled with this message but could it not be that I realized that my prayer on my knees asking the Father for help was very small and, and Jesus was always spending time with his father, healing people. He was doing this, doing that, and yet he would wake up early in the morning and go spend time with his father. 
in our human minds, don't you think it would have just been nice to sleep in for a morning? Jesus knew where his strength was. It was in his relationship with his father. It was in his father providing that strength. And his father was worthy of getting up and going, being on his face before him. God is that good. And so, do you see what's, what's happening here? We as people, we can, and, I, and I've done this, and I still struggle with this, but I will read my Bible and pray and check it off for the day. Totally forgetting that my God is worth pleasing. He's worth communing with. That's the truth. It's, it's the darkness, it's, the, it's the, the remaining sin within us that tells us he's not good. And therefore, to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, we'll go and we'll read the scripture for 15 minutes and pray for five and we'll check the list and say, yep, good job, Scott. Well done. So when Paul tells us, try and discern what is pleasing to the Lord, this should not be restrictive. What's pleasing to the Lord ought to be pleasing to us. Because he's good. Paul goes on, and these were the verses that I struggled with. Verses 11 through 14. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. They're unfruitful. Paul says in Romans, sin leads to death. They're unfruitful. Do not have anything to do with them. But instead, expose them. And this is the part I struggled with. Because it can be easy for our culture, in our idea of somehow there's a little light within me, that I would then stand up on a podium and expose someone else. Is that what Paul is saying? Or did we forget what he just said a couple verses ago? You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. The light of Christ has shone on your life. How does this affect how we handle others? And I'm thinking about unbelievers in this scenario. I, I lay out what, what is a possibility, possible scenario at the church in Ephesus. I can imagine that in the church at Ephesus there are former prostitutes, there are former men who went and used this service. There are also Jewish people who are part of this church who are coming out of a highly 
rigorous, um, disciplinarian setting in which they thought they were working to get to God. You had a complete mix of people in this church. And I can imagine that when Paul says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them, can you imagine what that brings to the mind of a former person that was in prostitution or used that service to to expose that to people that they worked alongside and that they were a part of that. I cannot imagine for one second that that conjures up this idea within them that I am going to stand on my little podium here and shout down at them. Because Paul says, for at one time, you were also darkness. You were also doing that. But what has changed in these people's lives? Christ has come in. It's about Christ. As I can imagine as they're conversing with these people. And notice he says the unfruitful works of darkness. He doesn't say have nothing to do with the people who are in that. Other place, Paul says, I do not say to, um, I don't remember word for word, but I don't say to not um, be among sinners, because otherwise we have to be taken out of the world, right? He says unfruitful works of darkness. And so I can imagine these people as they're interacting with this sphere of friends that they used to have. There is a there is a deep undergirding plea inside of them that says I once was that but now Christ has shown on me. Jesus changed everything. He's the light. I was darkness. But now because of him, I'm light. It's not to anything to do with me, it's because of him. And suddenly, we start coming down off of our podiums. Because he's the light that is changing us. We are being conformed to him, not asking people to conform to us. And this is done through a changed life. I skipped over verse 9 for a reason. It says, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. This is the fruit that comes out of our life when we realize who we are. That we are dependent. That we are broken. That outside of us, or, or outside of Christ, given over to just ourselves, we are sons of darkness. 
fruit is, is produced out of our realizing that. We realize that in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, and 6, Paul says this, For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Back in Genesis, he spoke and there was light. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's the light. God shines into our hearts. God says, let there be light. And you know how that light comes to us. We see Jesus for who he is. That he's the glory of God. And yet here he is. He took on our flesh. We see Jesus for who he is. We place our faith in him because we see ourselves as we are. Broken. Sons of disobedience. At one one time we walked in darkness. We see ourselves for who we are. That's the glory of the light. And I'm not even going to pretend to stand up here and know what verse 13 and 14 are exactly saying. I wrestled with it. But this light, I can't get away from what what the quote is that Paul makes in verse 14. The quote is, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. For those of you who are a believer, That's what's happened. This light comes, says, wake up. Arise from the dead. That's grace. Wake up. Rise from the dead. That's the glory of it. We were asleep otherwise. We were dead. Didn't care about the things of God. Lived as sons of disobedience. I don't care if you grew up in these pews or if you grew up at the bar down the street. We all walked as sons of disobedience. And this light comes from outside of us and says, wake up, rise from the dead. But this doesn't happen for people around us if we don't have Jesus at the center of our message. And as a result, our life. Because Paul goes on then and he says, 
Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He's saying, walk wisely. Walk cautiously. The days are evil. There is evil all around us. Yes, there are still things in our own heart, even as believers, that he will shine his light on as we walk and expose those things as well. But it won't happen unless if, if you think you are the light. It happens when you realize that the life of Jesus is the light. And you are conforming to him, to him, to him. So walk wisely, walk cautiously. Walk with him at the center. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit. Getting drunk is one of the ways that people deal with their hardness, the hardness of their heart. You, you could find the hardest-hearted individual sitting at a bar, countless drinks in, because they don't know how to deal with anything else, with, with, their, with their stuff any way else. What Paul is saying you be filled with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Allow Him to change your life. Allow Him to mold and shape you. And, and I... Verses 19 and 20 and 21. I, I, I can't necessarily give you a, a full interpretation. I'm just, what a, what a glorious message. As, as we meet with one another as believers. That we address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody to the Lord with our heart giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where does this heart of thankfulness come from? Where does it spring from? It's the knowledge that Jesus is our everything. <laughs> We're walking in light. We're no longer trying to do things behind doors in secret. Because we're walking in the light. And that's glorious. That is, that is, that's enough to get us singing. Praising him. Because he's the one that has exposed our darkness. So I would just say to you, people at Second Baptist, what does the city of Cumberland need? What does the city of Cumberland need? The 
light of Christ. That is primary. That is ultimate. The light of Christ. Things may shift, may move, may change, but that remains the same. Because our problem is sin. That's the problem here. That's the problem in my little rural town that I am from, Grantsville, Maryland, 30 minutes away. And it's the same in Vegas, and it's the same in the little farm town in Kentucky. Because you are either today a son of disobedience, that is your identity, or you are a child of light, and Christ has shone on you and showed you who you are. May that be at the center of Second Baptist's message. May that be at the center of what drives Second Baptist. As they interact, as you interact with each other, as we interact with each other. And, and repentance comes into this. Because if Christ is the light, light and his life is what we are conforming to, then there is always a need for repentance. Kevin talked about repentance last week at the end of his sermon. And I think he made the quote something like this. To be imitators of God, we must experience repentance. And we must go on experiencing repentance. Because we are always conforming to Christ as he graciously shines his light to reveal who we are more and more and more. So I just want to pray, and then uh, I'll turn the time back over to Hannah. Father, we thank you for your grace to us in Christ. And thank you that you have brought us to the knowledge of the glory of yourself in the face of Jesus Christ. For those who are believers here today, we have seen you, not ourselves. We have seen you for who you are. And yes, we have seen ourselves for who we are that we are in need. We desperately need you. And Father, we're... Every believer here is on a journey. Some at different places. But your son is the immovable, the immovable one that we cling to and hold on to. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here or watching online that now senses for the first time who you are and who they are that you would be near to them that you would shine your light into their life 
show them who your son is, that he in fact is God. He's fully God. He is able to forgive sins. He is able to deal with our problem. And at the end of the day, our only problem, and that is sin. And he has dealt with it on the cross. He was buried. Now he's risen. He's alive. He has gained victory over sin. So I pray that if there's someone like that that will hear this message, I pray that they will put their faith in your son. And I pray for a second Baptist. I pray that you would move in a mighty way in this church. I pray all this in your son's name.